Welcome, everybody. Uh, I get, uh, I think I can say this because I get to moderate. This is the most interesting panel of the day. Yes. Um, yes. The, the one you've all been waiting for on, on the big issue, the Indian uh, general elections. Uh, my name is Milan Vaishnav. I am a senior fellow and director of the South Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace here in Washington, DC. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'm joined today by two old uh, friends and longtime Washingtonians. Uh, to my left is Seema Sadohi, who is, for the past 20 plus years, we don't have to put a number to it, yeah, Seema, let's not. has, has, covered, years old. <laughs> has covered India, the United States, and US-India relations. Uh, she is a regular columnist for the Economic Times in India, and she's also a non-resident scholar at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Thanks for coming, Asima. Uh, and then to her left is uh, Rick Rosso, who is a senior advisor and holds the Wadwani Chair in U.S.-India Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Prior to joining CSIS, uh, Rick spent almost two decades in the private sector, learning the hard truths of the ease of doing business in <laughs> India or the unease of doing business in India, depending on how you see it. Um, and we're happy that both of you could be here today. Uh, Irfan has asked me to begin uh, laying out uh, kind of the scene uh, of the elections and a couple of election scenarios. Seema is going to then talk about sort of foreign policy and foreign, foreign policy implications of the election, and Rick will be doing the same with respect to economic policy. So uh, I will try to be as brief as I can so you can hear from, uh, from our two speakers. Uh, as most of you know, the 17th Indian general elections began yesterday, uh, April 11th, where voting took place in 91 constituencies across 20 states. Between April 11th and May 19th, there will be seven phases of the general election, with each phase a different segment of the country going to the polls. Uh, no votes will be counted until May 23rd, uh, when the 1.7 million electronic voting machines will be tabulated, and hopefully, Within a few hours, we will have the results. There will no, not be any Florida recount hanging Chad uh, moments because there are no uh, paper ballots used throughout the system. Um, just to give you a sense of where I think the election are, and, and this is maybe where, where you guys can disagree, is you know if we had this conversation in the beginning of 2017, I think we'd be having a very different uh, kind of conversation, right? At that point, most people predicted that the 2019 election would be a cakewalk for Mr. Modi and the BJP. Uh, in the early part of that year, he had triumphantly led his uh, BJP, Bharatiya Janta Party, uh, to a three-quarters majority in the Uttar Pradesh State Assembly elections. You had opposition leaders openly tweeting that let's just forget about 2019, we should focus on 2024 because there's no way that we're going to be able to stop this electoral juggernaut. At the start of 2019, the situation seems very different. Uh, Rahul Gandhi and his Congress party uh, uh, snatched back three important states in the Hindi heartland, which are longtime BJP bastions, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. The important thing about these three states are they're also three states that the BJP virtually swept in the 2014 general election. So this was a sign that maybe the Congress and the opposition had sort of new winds in their sails. And I think there's three underlying factors that have led to that change in narrative, you know, from a cakewalk to uh, a contest. The first is obviously the state of the economy. Uh, despite his lofty promises on the campaign trail in 2013 and 2014, Mr. Modi's economic record has been quite mixed. Growth has been solid, but by no means stellar. If you just look at GDP growth over the past five years, you see a lot of peaks and valleys, right? No consistent secular increase. Jobs and unemployment have become a big political issue. Uh, the recent report of the government, which they had not released, but which had been leaked to the media, showed a spike in the unemployment rate. And of course, the rural sector, we're seeing lots of what we call in India agrarian distress. Uh, agricultural prices are at an 18-year low. We've seen rural wages stagnate when half of your labor force uh, is directly or indirectly employed by agriculture. This is not just a major economic issue, it's also a political one. Uh, the second changing factor has been incumbency. So if you look at a map of the 2014 electoral verdict, you will note that just about eight states uh, accounted for 75% of the BJP's tally. They're 282 seats, that historic victory that they notched in 2014. 
So to replicate that kind of result means you have a very thin margin of error. You have to essentially run the tables in those eight states of largely the Hindi heartland and of Western India in order to uh, reproduce that single party majority. And the third thing which has changed is coalitions. Many opposition parties, many regional parties, and the Congress in 2014 decided to contest elections uh, one uh, taking Modi and the BJP on one by one rather than in concert. And we have seen uh, over time, particularly in the last uh, 12 months or 18 months, a series of opportunistic alliances form with no other purpose than to keep the BJP uh, out of power. So that's sort of what I think has changed over the past one to two years. Now, what is happening now? I would submit that the momentum, or the hava, as we like to say, uh, has shifted more in the direction of the BJP and against the opposition uh, for a couple, of, a couple of reasons. One is the latest polling uh, done by CSDS, which is the only social science organization which does regular election polling in India, suggests that Modi's popularity is quite enduring. Despite whatever grievances people might have about the economy, about majoritarianism, about nationalism, people seem to like uh, Narendra Modi quite a bit. The second issue is on coalitions. As the opposition has been forging coalitions, so has the BJP. They have not uh, stood silent in a corner. Uh, Amit Shah, the party president, has uh, methodically stitched up coalitions in Maharashtra, in Bihar, in Tamil Nadu, across the Northeast, and these are electorally uh, critical states. And then, of course, most recently, we see the tensions between India and Pakistan, uh, where you know uh, a lot of us here in Washington have been debating, you know, did India really shoot down a Pakistani F-16? Did they actually bomb a Jaishy Muhammad terror camp in, in in Pakistan? You know, what actually happened? These facts seem to be relatively irrelevant to the larger political discourse because the mood in the country is such that. People are celebrating the fact that finally, after adopting a, a position of strategic restraint, the government has struck back and struck back hard against Pakistan. So that's, I think, a little bit of the mood uh, of, of, the, of the country. Let me just end, and then I'll turn it over to, to Seema, with election scenarios, right? This is, at the end of the day, I think what most of us uh, kind of care about. I think there are roughly three scenarios uh, with different levels or different probabilities. Uh, the first is that the BJP gets around 250 or 260 seats on its own, which would mean not quite matching the mark of 2014 when it had 282, but fairly close to getting a majority with its existing uh, National Democratic Alliance partners would easily form the government and Mr. Modi would be the prime minister. I think that's uh, not a high probability, but the probabilities are increasing given, uh, given recent events. I still think for most election analysts, uh, analysts the base case is that uh, Mr. Modi and the BJP would get maybe between 210 and 230 seats with, with their uh, existing allies may fall just short of, of, of a parliamentary majority, but would have no problem getting sufficient allies to cross the magic number of 272. And again, of course, in that scenario, Mr. Modi would remain the prime minister. Um, I think that's probably, if I had to take a poll, where most election analysts are. The third scenario, which most people rate as the least likely of the three, is that the BJP would severely underperform its 2014 benchmark and drop about 100 seats, so only get roughly 180 or 190 on its own. At that point, one of two things could happen. It's theoretically possible that the BJP could form the next government, but in order to attract the 100 or so seats you would need from your allies, you would have to uh, leave Mr. Modi behind and find a more transactional, more collegial, frankly, less popular BJP leader who would lead the coalition. So this is the Nitin Gadkari or the Rajnath Singh kind of fantasy option that, that many people uh, think about. Another possible scenario, and I think maybe the more likely one, would be that the BJP would decide to sit in opposition, let a coalition government come to power, 
and then hopefully crumble <laughs> under the weight of its own contradictions, <laughs> and then Mr. Modi would come in like the knight in shining armor to save the day. Uh, I don't think we'll probably get to scenario three. That's my humble submission at this point, but uh, everyone thought that you know 2004 would be a raring re-election for the BJP, and we all know uh, what, what happened next. So. Having quickly uh, and hopefully set the table, let me turn now to, to, the, to the real substance. Seema, I want to start with you, if I could, on this question of, of foreign policy, because it has been thrust in a very unexpected way into the limelight. And I sort of want to ask you two questions. The first is, do you agree with the assessment I laid out that on net-net, the recent tensions between India and Pakistan have been helpful? to the ruling party and Mr. Modi. And number two is based on the scenarios I've outlined, whether you agree or disagree, uh, what do you think the consequences of those various scenarios would be for foreign policy? And since we're in Washington, I have to ask you specifically for, for US-India relations. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for setting the table so well. Um, so usually, uh, um, voters will vote on bread and butter issues, but this time I think foreign policy has sort of invaded the space in an unexpected way, um, given the Indo-Pak crisis, and Modi is exploiting it to the hilt. This is the ground where he's the most confident. Um, you know, saying things like he alone can keep the country secure. The opposition, on the other hand, has failed completely, I think, in shifting this narrative to bread and butter issues, to unemployment, to lack of jobs, to the agrarian crisis, what have you. I mean, there's so many uh, burning issues. So uh, can the opposition puncture holes? Because we still have some time uh, in this Chokida slash uh, watchman narrative. I don't think so, at least not easily, um, because of the complexity of the questions around this Indo-Pak crisis that we had. Um, you know, the utter failure of intelligence uh, to sort of predict this attack. Secondly, the questions around the Indian Air Force. Um, did they hit the targets? Did they down an F-16, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Um, many, many things went wrong. Um, we even lost a helicopter in friendly fire. But how do you reduce these complex questions to, uh, you know, to a simple narrative of uh, incompetence without criticizing the armed forces? I think that's very difficult. Um, and the result is Modi has momentum uh, again. But my uh, question is, will the rural voters, who come out in larger numbers than urban voters, uh, will they be affected uh, by this you know, whole national security narrative? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think any of us can safely predict that, um, because Indian voters can really surprise you. Um, after, after all, in 2008, after the Mumbai attacks, uh, the Congress party didn't retaliate against Pakistan, yet went on to, uh, to win the elections. Um, so to your second questions about the broad implications, foreign policy implications of the various scenarios, um, I'd like to make a few basic points first, that the upward trajectory of Indo-US relations will likely continue in almost all scenarios. Um, with differences in nuance and emphasis. Um, because national security interests don't change because governments change. Uh, this partnership, the US-India partnership, has gone from zero to 100 in the last uh, couple of decades. And it has seen growth under both parties in both countries, both major parties in India, Congress and the BJP, and both parties in the US, Republicans and Democrats. Um, I mean, I can remember a time when American diplomats would actually worry about the outcome of Indian elections. Um, in 2004, uh, when um, Prime Minister Vajpayee's government was in power, um, and then the Congress defeated uh, BJP, 
uh, US diplomats really were concerned that what will happen to the dialogue that was going on between Jaswan Singh and Strobe Talbot, uh, what will happen to the strategic partnership. Um, these were the pre-nuclear deal days. Um, the two sides were trying to rationalize India's nuclear status, this very peculiar status of being a nuclear power, but outside the charmed circle of the five uh, permanent members of the Security Council. So uh, turned out the Washington's fears were unfounded. Uh, under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, the Congress party signed the mother of all deals, the civilian nuclear deal with the United States. So um, today we can see a convergence on major issues. Um, like how to tackle the rise of China being the most important, I would say, um, and increasingly on Pakistan under President Trump. So uh, Trump's unpredictability may make uh, India hedge a little bit more, but it doesn't mean that uh, India will view China with benign eyes. You know, in, we have a huge border dispute with them. So if uh, Prime Minister Modi is back with a comfortable majority, the upward trends will continue um, and may even strengthen, barring some unforeseen crisis, like the US decides to put sanctions on India for buying the S-400 from Russia. That's like a black swan event. We don't know, you know whether the US will put sanctions, but that could throw things off. Um, so if you look at the two manifestos, the Congress Party and the BJP, uh, the BJP is, is very bland. It doesn't give priority to the US. It doesn't talk about the strategic partnership. Uh, the US is mentioned only in the context of a trilateral grouping of Japan, America, and India, and a very generic indirect reference to the Indo-Pacific. But if you look at Modi's record in the first term, um, Despite being berated constantly by Trump on trade issues, uh, he has moved right along on strategic issues. Uh, India has adopted the language of the whole Indo-Pacific policy. It has signed uh, what the US calls foundational agreements. Three of the four have now been signed. Uh, these uh, two, the last two that Modi signed were in negotiation for 10 years, but Modi did take the plunge and the government signed. So uh, these increase interoperability between the two defense forces and uh, you know that's all for the better. The quadrila uh, quadrilateral dialogue of the four democracies, US, Japan, India, and Australia is revived. Even if all the four countries are still feeling their way about how to make it more meaningful, but it's happening. People are meeting on a regular basis. Uh, the defense relationship between India and the US is growing. Uh, so the main challenges I see are uh, the proposed exit of US troops from Afghanistan. That's a big concern for India. And the friction on trade issues uh, that I'm sure Rick will highlight. Um, then uh, uh, India's relationship with Russia and uh, the oil from Iran, those are all areas where we could see potential trouble. If the Congress party comes to power with, uh, you know, uh, leads a coalition with the Congress as the dominant party, um, I don't think that they'll go back in time and sort of cancel agreements that Modi has signed. They may do more balancing between the US, Russia, and China. Um, they, there's a strain of thinking in the Congress party which which says that we have to live with China, we have to find some sort of accommodation. They're not into taking China on or being aggressive. Uh, the Congress Party manifesto mentions non-alignment, but I don't think anyone in Washington should worry too much about it. It's just kind of a cover. It's like a bow to Pandit Nehru and to history. Uh, it's not a confining concept. I don't think anymore in Indian foreign policy. Um, the most interesting thing about the Congress Party manifesto I found was they have promised to increase defense spending. Uh, 
that should gladden the hearts of U.S. defense manufacturers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because under Modi, uh, that bit has been declining, you know, uh, shockingly so. So he, on the one hand, he's the chokidar. On the other hand, you know, we don't have enough planes, we don't have enough of anything, even guns. In fact, just on that, someone told me this anecdote the other day, which, you know, for a government that came in saying we're going to be tough on defense and we're going to cut entitlements, defense is at its lowest share of GDP ever and social welfare is at its highest share of GDP ever. Exactly. Um, so if a th uh, the last scenario, if uh, there's a third party prime minister in a weak coalition um, because the Congress and BJP both do badly, then we might have a problem. Uh, foreign policy will take a back seat, I think, uh, because they'll be fighting daily battles of survival. Uh, they'll be more indecision and things may not move as fast as the US or any other foreign government may like. But I think that's a very unlikely scenario. So just to quickly follow up before I turn to Rick, you are drawing a distinction between two types of coalitions. On the one hand, there are coalitions which have either national party, the Congress or the BJP, as the center of gravity, in which case you think things will roughly be, with shades of difference, more or less uh, the same. But if we get to that scenario where neither major party is part of a coalition, where you get a kitchity sort of government, as they like to say, uh, you do think that holds some, some risk. Is that an accurate summary? Yes. I mean, the risk uh, to the extent that nothing will be decided. I mean, as it is, we are an indecisive country, right? <laughs> I mean, even under Modi, it has taken so long to decide on certain things. Um, I mean, the, the bid for the fighter jet, I don't know how long it's been going on anymore. You know, we're still not there there. So if it's a Kichri coalition, um, I think we don't know. Uh, if, let's say, Mamta Banerjee <laughs> is the prime minister, who is going to be her national security advisor? Right. Who's going to be her foreign minister? I mean, I really don't have a sense of, uh, how they think about the world, mm -hmm. uh, how they want to engage with the world. So yes, that, but hopefully that may not come to pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rick, thank you, Seema. Rick, let's t turn to the economics. Um, you know, many analysts look at the past five years and say, at the end of the day, I'm not sure that a UPA3 would have been that different, right? I mean, there's the former BJP minister Arun Shori's comment that this government is just UPA plus cow, right? Um, uh, so the question is, do you kind of agree, forget about the cow part, but uh, do you agree on the economic side of the house that there has been broad consistency? You know, there's that old adage that Montek Singh Alawalia coined that in India, there's a strong consensus for weak reforms, yeah. right? Um, uh, so do you agree on that? And number two, if I could just ask you to also kind of consider these scenarios, uh, what impact do you think they have on, on economic policy? Yeah. Thanks, Millen. Um, well, I think, you know, if you look at the economy at large right now, it's doing pretty good. Uh, growth is okay. I don't think anybody's going to risk their life savings that the numbers are entirely real. But, you know, you, you got this group of China mandarins that look at the in inputs to the Chinese economy is oil coming in or the importing exporting and you can come up with a rough rough approximation of whether china's numbers are real unfortunately india doesn't yet have that cottage industry but if you're doing rough of the back of the envelope imports are growing dramatically exports are growing dramatically uh, foreign investments growing dramatically compared to what it was historically portfolio investment is starting to bounce back so uh you know is the economy seven percent doesn't feel too far off when you look at the things that are more quantifiable by external agencies so i'm not too worried about that Foreign direct investment's doing pretty well. Uh, trade is growing dramatically. I mean, one of my most recent pieces, which I think kind of shocks the Washington community, if you look at the, the five largest economies on Earth, India is actually middle of the pack in terms of trade intensity to GDP. We often think India is not a trading economy because you, you look at Delhi and some of the hikes in customs duties recently and import substitution rules. Sure, the government in Delhi is definitely trying to put up a lot of roadblocks to trade, but trade is more an amalgamation of a lot of private players doing their own thing and they're deciding India is a great place to trade with. So trade numbers are looking pretty good right now. Um, so the numbers are pretty good, but there's obviously some dark clouds out there right now as we end the, uh, the five-year term of the Modi government. 
Um, you know, the bank debt crisis still hasn't unraveled itself. We still don't know exactly how bad and how bad the depths are, particularly of the state-owned banks. Uh, the jobs numbers, again, anybody in this room that's going to fall on the sword based on numbers that you see government agencies put out, don't do it. <laughs> we don't know. We don't have any idea. We have sense. We have, but, you know, the formal sector is only 10% of the economy. Measuring informal is pretty tough. But, you know, I mean, I, I think uh, Congress, particularly in three states, Millen, you mentioned, ran uh, in large part on the jobs thing. It apparently resonated. So, you know, you can come up with an approximation that clearly jobs is a problem, even if we don't really understand, I think, definitively how grand of a scale. Um, the trade balance, this is a primary policy driver of the Modi government on the economy in recent years. India's trade balance, and this again is something that I think is poorly understood in Washington, um, the trade deficit and goods trade uh, this last year was about $180 billion. That's roughly 8% of India's GDP. That's the trade deficit. The United States, like you know the kind of issues we've got with trade right now, our trade deficit as a percent of GDP is like 2 or 3%. India's is multiples of that. So like when, when they put up these barriers, you know, it's not because they're like, I hate the world. <laughs> it's because they, they look at the number. And I know a lot of great trade economists that can say, you can't look at the number. It's not really this and this and that minus that. There's inputs and ex whatever. But every leader in the world looks at the number. What are your imports? What are your exports? If there's an imbalance, then you want to take steps to, uh, to try to push that back. So I think by and large, the economic numbers are pretty good. But uh, there are some pretty dark clouds there. Uh, Modi's track record over five years, actually, I do rate it higher than almost anybody else that you're going to speak to. Um, but there are also two distinct phases. Um, you know, we have this uh, very systematic process. We developed this scorecard of 30 reforms the day Modi came to office. We pulled together, you know, great economists, the big trade associations, went through all their literature, and we came up, what were the 30 biggest things that the smartest people on earth said the Modi government should do during its five years in office? So five years in, the Modi government has done nine of the 30 things we highlighted. And that seems pretty solid. And another, uh, another 15, they've taken partial steps, like insurance. They increased the FDI cap, but not the majority ownership. You know, they, they, uh, they stopped all new cases of retrospective taxation. But they didn't write it out of law, so they still have the ability to initiate retrospective taxation. Um, so, so there's a lot of areas where they, you know, they went part way, but didn't quite take it all the way. There's only six of the 30 that they really didn't touch at all. That seems like a pretty good track record. But underneath that, of the nine of these big reforms the Modi government did, six of those were the first year in office. Only three more of these big 30 were completed during the last four years. So out of the gates fast. And some big ones. I mean, anybody that argues and debates is Modi a reformer and can't talk about the hydrocarbon exploration licensing policy. And not many people can. But if you're in the oil and gas industry, they completely reshaped the entire regime under which you'd look for oil and gas. They did the first round of licensing for new oil and gas blocks under that. They increased the acreage for oil and gas exploration by 60% in one, one fell swoop. Like there's all these like reforms that are they're very sector and focused and narrow. But to those industries, I mean, when, when India achieved its 10% growth rates a little over a decade ago, it was really on the backs of a couple of industries that had been freed right before that. Insurance, telecom, and the telecom liberalization which triggered the IT revolution. I mean, those three went from nothing to, you know, 100% growth rates. So, you know, you unleash a few sectors at a time, and it's a pretty smart policy. I mean, the other big things people point to, of course, bankruptcy and GST. I mean, those are the two that are most commonly brought up. But if you're in the oil and gas industry, help, the help policy is way bigger than, than GST is, per se. So... You know, a lot of sectoral things, too, that had, a, that had a pretty big impact. But again, even if you look at foreign investment reforms, too. So foreign investment reforms in India are laid out through this uh, specific process, a press note that's issued by the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. So you can kind of measure, like, how fast do governments reform FDI caps over time because you've got something specific to look at. And uh, Modi has done about 40 of these positive FDI changes since coming to office. That's double the rate of either Vajpayee or Manmohan Singh in first or second term. But again, of the 40, almost all of those took place the first two years in office. The last two years in particular have really been a dead zone on trying to do more things on foreign investment. In fact, we've seen some snapback moves. Um, you know, this uh, recent notice about uh, new, new e-commerce regulations, which sort of stifle the model that a couple of foreign players do, um, data localization for banking transactions. So you've seen the government, even on things to encourage foreign investment, um, where it's kind of taken a downward trend. But, even Modi's simple embrace publicly of foreign investors. 
mean, it seems like kind of an obvious thing. What foreign leader wouldn't want to invite the Fords and the GMs and folks like that to come invest in the economy? But, you know, in India, before Modi, it really wasn't cool to be seen doing that kind of stuff. You know, Manmohan Singh would do it, but not happily. I mean, I know working my days at the U.S. India Business Council, you know, we get a call, oh, the prime minister will meet with a couple of CEOs, but come in through the kitchen at the hotel, don't let anybody see you, you know, be very quiet, you know? And, uh, you know, I heard stories uh, from the folks at USIBC after I left, of course, when everything good happens. And, you know, they reach out to the prime minister's office and they come back with seven times, tell us what's worked best for you. You know, so even that like open embrace and encouragement, it really is kind of a sea change. I mean, being seen as encouraging foreign investment went from night to day, you know, switched the, the switch almost immediately. But again, you know, most of the bigger stuff you saw on that front, too, were the early years in office. So I, I rate his tenure higher than most, but a clear distinction. The first two years, full guns, huge reforms, huge reforms, the coal reform. I mean, India, whether we like it or not because it's dirty, India is a coal economy. There was one company in India that was allowed to dig coal out of the ground and sell it freely, Coal India. India has the third largest reserves of coal in the world and imported 1% of GDP in coal. That's not good. <laughs> third largest reserves and you import 1% of your GDP in coal. And because of this crisis where they, the Supreme Court revoked a bunch of coal licenses, you know, Modi went to parliament and liberalized the sector. So now private firms are able to own mines and sell freely. Um, a lot of big reforms early on, but those are already so far in the rearview mirror that it feels like, you know, what it have you done for true. us lately? Yeah. In terms of looking at the agenda, um, and one area I didn't talk about was center state relations. I think they did some, again, pretty good things early on. Uh, they set up this uh, reform scorecard for states to try to adopt. The first version of it had 98 factors, and they asked states to self-report. A couple of states were at 70%. Most states were at 30% pretty good. They now cover 400 and something factors, but most states are grouped at the 95 to 98% range. <laughs> it's not credible. So they got out of the gate pretty well too on trying to push states to do a little more, but uh, I think they lost the narrative on that a little bit too. So just in terms of uh, go forward, I mean, um, you know, reassert this idea about getting states to compete. States control everything that matters in India and are, there's no transparency. There's very little work to really get states to do better. If you have water, electricity, sanitation, healthcare, education, law and order, that is your chief minister, not your prime minister. And there is very little work to get chief ministers to do a better job. It's a black box. I mean, who in this room could tell me three or four important reforms a state government has done anywhere in India in the last 10 years? You know? Yeah, so get states to do better. Um, I think they gotta, they gotta finalize the GST. I mean, these sectors that they left out of it, alcohol, diesel and stuff, it's a huge part of states' budgets, and it's totally outside the ambit. So GST was good, but in practice, it's only half done if you look at the areas where states are in revenue. Uh, land and labor are clearly there, judicial backlog of cases. And finally, just open up the door on foreign direct investment. There still are so many sectors, insurance and retail and banking and other areas that still have foreign equity limitations. Find the areas that are dangerous and strategic, write those in a list and say, not here and everything else is 100% without Byzantine rules. You know, foreign investment, it's not the thing that's gonna remake the economy, but it's the thing that adds more incremental value to the economy. If you place global production in a country, that is far better than Tata building another plant for domestic consumption. Because if it wasn't Tata, it would have been somebody else, it would have been Mahindra. But if Ford decides to go to India for global production, that is incrementally better value of investment than, uh, than you get from domestic. I think, you know, looking at the economy, and I'll, I'll wrap here, um, if, if Modi comes back, and whether it's him or whether it's him in a coalition, I think you're bound to see probably a very similar framework. Reform early, focus on social programs, and throw out some terrible ideas at the end of your administration. Because reforms, either they take a while to gestate, you know, you open up the coal sector, well, companies have to get a license, hire people, get a mine, start digging, start selling. It takes years. Some reforms like GST cost short-term pain, so reform early. I think, and if Modi has a coalition too, you look at his coalition partners, I don't see any of them as particularly anti-reform. I think in Washington where you just, you remember the break that the communists put against the Congress government on reform early days and what Trinamul and others did later on, you know, the BJP will look further right. And either they don't care about reform or they're generally kind of supportive. So BJP or BJP plus, I think you'll likely see very similar things, reforms early and then, and then a bit of a slowdown in that. If Congress comes back, it's not going to be a strong Congress government. I think you're going to see a reversion to what you saw in the last Congress governments. Uh, every ministry working totally separately. 
uh, very little coordination done there. So if, if in, a, in a Congress-led scenario, I think you're more likely to see maybe some individual standouts. Um, some ministries will decide to take forward big ideas. Other ones will work for, I mean, if they've got a lot of coalition partners, they'll work for self-enrichment, which happened a lot during Congress. Um, so I think Congress will be a, a mixed bag. Some ministries with key folks that are drivers will do good things, but uh, there's gonna be very difficult to, I think, come up with a common theme and narrative on a farm. That's it. Thanks, Rick. Yep. So it's, uh, thank you very much. Um, so it's 1.15, I have a ton of questions, but since we have to wrap at 1.30, I'm gonna just go ahead and, and open it up to, to your questions. Please uh, wait for the mic, identify yourself, keep your questions short so we can take as many as, as, as possible. Uh, this gentleman here in the second row. Right here in the second. The guy with the good hair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rick. This is for Seema. Can you um, just quickly identify Sure. Yourself? My name is Vijay Sazawal. I am the founder of Kashmir Forum. Uh, the, uh, my question was uh, actually uh, started the comment, which is about what, what government will we face if Mamta Banerjee becomes the... Prime Minister, I mean, the model that I can see closest is the VP Singh model. And, uh, and, and that was a, you know, that you had a very unsavory mixture of cabinet members, including Mufti Saeed from Kashmir as Home Minister, who pretty much destroyed Kashmir, state of Jammu and Kashmir. Could I just ask you to get to your question? Sorry, just because we're no, short so my, on time. My, my, my question is, my question is, do you see something similar happening if Mamta Banerjee essentially were to become the new prime minister, that will we have ministers with very poor track record of really understanding how the, how the states are run and managed and governed? Thank okay. you. Uh, we have a question off here to the left. Thank you. Uh, Stefan Tetzler from the German Historical Institute. Uh, my question is for Rick. Um, you said um, open up the Indian economy for foreign direct investment. Um, and I want, just want to ask, um, in the light of the Chinese uh, development, economic development, um, what kind of strictures would you put as a politician in India um, to um, channel foreign direct investment in a specific way, if there is any that you would recommend? What kind of restrictions? What kind of um, uh, strictures, what kind of limitations to foreign direct oh. investment would you put? Uh, I assume your question is a bit because Chinese security and Huawei 5G, things of that, that nature? Yeah, okay. Uh, Seema, um, what kind of ministers we get? I mean, I would submit that we've gotten all kinds of ministers in all sorts of governments, but... Right. I mean, um, firstly, I think that scenario is unlikely. Um, if that happens, you could see some innovative policies vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh. Who knows? Because, you know, West Bengal is uh, very close to Bangladesh. You just never know. But I frankly don't have a sense of what she thinks of the world or, or even Amit Mitra or people who are important, who are around her, uh, how they would engage with the US. Um, you know, to some extent, she tends to lean left, you know, so there could be a resurgent strain that distance yourself from the US. But your uncertainty is not just only about Mamta. It's, it would be about whether it's Akhilesh, whether it's Mayavati, whether it's Jagan, whether it's whoever, right? Right. Right. Rick, uh, China and s s concerns in India about Chinese inward investment. Well, I, I wouldn't recommend any country pull out blanket restrictions except for in critical sectors. Um, I, I don't suspect under any circumstance India is going to open up the owning and operating of nuclear power plants, or should I say owning of nuclear power plants. Um, uh, there may still be restrictions. I, I don't suspect that news media is going to be terribly lifted um, as fast as, as we might want to see. But uh, underneath that, you know, there are others like uh, owning and operating telecom networks, which India already allows foreign firms to do, um, uh, airlines, things like that, which are sometimes looking at the strategic lens. Um, India has danced around for a long time of setting up a, a, a cfius like program to review those investments. Um, this is frankly an area that I think international cooperation needs to be strengthened immediately because the United States is investing a lot of Ch Chinese state-owned entities that are looking to make investments in the United States. You know, we presumably uncover interesting information about the true ownership of those firms. We've blocked some of those investments. Um, I think U.S. ability to investigate this in China and other places is a little bit more robust. So um, uh, I think India has got to set up an institution like that. 
but I think international coordination in that space too has got to uh, begin uh, immediately in a much more vibrant way. I think right now most of the information we gather is only shared with the five eyes, our, our closest intelligence partners, but uh, certainly there's space to do some for countries like India as well. So a few sectors, keep them closed. CFIUS review, international cooperation for things like CFIUS when we all uncover interesting, interesting information. <laughs> Great. So I've seen three hands up, so I'll go uh, Neeraj right here in the time. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Uh, Neeraj from Tufts University. Uh, so, so there's a good chance that we'll have a coalition government, uh, either BJP or Congress. Uh, so, so do you think this, this coalition will have a positive or a negative effect on the pace and direction of reforms? Um, okay. Uh, this young lady here in the third row. Yeah, please. Uh, Milam, I uh, wanted to congratulate you personally on your podcast on Grand Tamasha. Um, I hear it every year, and I know that recently you interviewed Snigda Poonam, um, and what will the first-time voters and how they'll impact um, this election. Quick question for you. To what extent will their participation numerically impact the votes, the seats in Parliament? And secondly, do you think both parties have done enough to cater to you know, their needs in their campaigning? Okay, great. Uh, question in the back. Uh, this gentleman here with his hand up. Uh, Pinaki Panigrahi, I'm a pediatric infectious disease person, so I don't belong to this uh, discussion group. Uh, <laughs> we I all belong to... here. You don't have to apologize. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to the panel to think about uh, health. And the reason I was really enamored with Modi, because in the first time he spoke at the United Nations is, uh, was that about uh, water sanitation and hygiene, and he said that it is really bad and it's a, it's a shame, he said, to, for Indian women and men to defecate in the open. And uh, he was telling that people told me that, hey, Modi ji, isme aap hat mat it's a very difficult, complex problem. But I told them, logo ne mujhe pradhan mantri chuna hai chota mota kam karne ke liye thodi. I, am, I know it is complex, I'm going to do it. But I, I, I don't see a whole lot of that uh, happening in the last uh, three, four years, even about uh, public health, because India still has total two schools of public health, 450 medical schools, whereas in the US we have 64, 65 schools of public health and about 165, 170 medical schools. So what do you think is happening in that 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 uh, space? Great question. Yeah, under the Thank regime. you, sir. Uh, Rick, you want to take the one about coalitions? Yeah, I could do some of the health ones, too. Do, yeah. So coalitions, I mean, I tried to touch on this at the end of my remarks. I think a, a BJP-led coalition, uh, we're going to be fine. I think uh, I don't see the parties that would be part of that as breaks on, on reforms necessarily. Uh, Congress-led coalition is going to be so disparate, uh, every ministry unto themselves, that uh, I do think they're going to have a tougher time kind of walking a straight line, taking tough decisions. But you'll have some stars, right? The fact that they're not under thumb uh, means that individual ministries that want to move will have maybe a little more freedom to do so than some of the ministers under this dispensation. Um, on health, I'm actually running a project and my colleague Afina here in the second row, so you might want to come up and chat with her as well. Um, we track Indian state regulations very closely at my program, so uh, we got hired to do a project, a gap analysis. So, so the real answer is there's 29 different answers to that. You know, there's not a lot that Delhi can do to initiate dramatic health reforms at the state level. It's a state subject. States have to go and do a lot of the work there. You see some announcements, you know, for instance, Modi, with uh, the toilet building program. And I think independent experts that have went have said that, um, you know, they're building a lot of toilets. The quality of some of them is poor, but a lot more people have access. So pretty good. Not as good as the government announces, but better than certainly what existed before. But water, I think you hit on a great point. Of all these grand programs Modi's announced on, let's build toilets, like cooking gas cylinders, electrify every village, all these huge things. Clean drinking water, which kills more babies in India than anything else we're talking about, has not yet made the agenda. And I sure hope that happens. So toilets is there, the health insurance program is there. There, there are a lot of things that they kind of thrown at the wall, but water remains uh, kind of undone, so it's a great point. Seema, do you want to take on any of these questions. Uh, so on the question of first-time voters, I mean, what do we know? We know that roughly there'll be 130 million first-time voters. These are people between the ages of 18 and 23 who've never voted in a national election. Just to give you some comparative context, that's roughly the size of the population of Japan, the population of Mexico, and the entirety of the American electorate that voted in our last presidential election. <laughs> and that's just the first-time voters, so it's a big number. So two things I think have been true historically about first-time voters. One is that they uh, don't vote 
as frequently as older folks. And number two is they don't seem to demonstrate any clear partisan attachment. What was interesting about 2014 is both of those uh, assumptions were overturned. Uh, the voter turnout rate for first-time voters actually was a few percentage points higher than the average voter turnout rate. That had never happened before as long as we've been collecting data. And number two is they broke decisively for Mr. Modi and the BJP, which is one of the great ironies that Rahul Gandhi, a man several decades younger than Mr. Modi, finds it much harder to connect to young people than, than the much older leader of the BJP does. So it's impossible to summarize where young voters are today what the survey evidence seems to suggest is that Modi's favorability still remains very high amongst first-time voters because uh, of two factors. One is they appreciate his strong and decisive leadership and believe that he is incorruptible, and that gives them a lot of hope uh, 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 about the future. Um, and number two is that they feel that five years is too short a time frame to expect the kinds of rapid change. And so in this sense, Modi's plea that I need more than five years to undo 65 years of history, I think has struck uh, a chord, it seems, particularly w uh, with young voters. We have about five minutes left. Should we do one quick kind of lightning round? Okay, you, sir, in the front. Very quickly, please. Could you just wait for the mic? Thanks for the opportunity. So the main thing in coalition I am trying to understand your opinion is the play of the regional parties which are having more state interests. The federal state relations have been very confusing to a common man voting at the level, especially in the states where central party and state party are not same. What do you think your opinion coming out of that either India or America also I see this problem of state versus national parties, especially in terms of elections when a common man want to vote. Okay, uh, great. Uh, young lady here in the white. Thanks for calling me young. <laughs> <laughs> Moshmi Joshi, I'm an international trade attorney here in Washington, D.C. Um, my question is to you, Rick. Um, now, Modi put in a lot of his personal capital in mending relations with the U.S., starting with Obama and continuing with, with the Trump administration, um, really towards increasing investments in India, you know, towards the Make in India initiative. How much of that personal sort of relationship building exercise has actually resulted mm. in increased U.S. investment flows into India, um, and, and the same would go for Japan, but I appreciate your, your thoughts on the, on the US piece. Thanks. Let's take one last question. I think there was a hand in the back somewhere. Uh, no, this gentleman here, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Vaibhav, and I'm a student at George Washington University. My question is for Rick. Rick, you mentioned that there have been some reforms uh, taken specifically for sectors like coal and hydrocarbons. I was uh, wondering if you have any thoughts on how this impacts the environment, if the environmental standards have been met appropriately, if the assess assessments are transparent, and the whole process. Well, uh, Seema, you didn't get a question, so let me just ask you one. Um, one of the big concerns in the U.S.-India relationship is that the economic woes will start to spill over to the security side of the house. Is there any reason for optimism that economic government-to-government -government relationships might improve post this election? Uh, but Rick, why don't we start with you, since there are a couple there headed yeah. your way. Well, on the coalition question, um, you know, basically, when you think of state and regional parties, a lot of times they just don't care about what's happening in Delhi, per se. So they would, you know, a, a few parties are positive on reforms. I mean, Chanda Baba Naidu is probably the biggest supporter of, I mean, most of what Modi has done that we see as positive, empowering bureaucrats and engaging the world. You learn that from uh, Naidu's innings in 94 to 2004. So you got a couple of folks like that that are actually champions of reforms. A lot of state parties that are very anti what we consider reform, and then some that try to intervene on foreign affairs. You know, the Tamil, the, the Tamil parties, you know, with Sri Lanka and things like that. So there's three basic lenses where, where state parties care about issues in Delhi, but it's, it's you know, very, very narrow, I think. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, reforms uh, in the energy sector, so, you know, Modi, it's been everything, right? I mean, this Uday program to bail out the broke power distribution utilities, um, which is a great thing. Uh, uh, Sobagya to deliver electricity for the first time to every home. Um, the most politically courageous thing that Modi has done, bar none, is this 175 gig renewable power target. States are not ready to do that. Voters are not ready to pay the high price for renewable power, but he's trying real hard to get that to, to happen. Um, so you've got kind of an all of the above sort of thing happening. It wasn't just coal and oil to try to, but certainly you know, the polluting impacts of that are gonna be uh, significant. Um, but, you know, a lot of pollution in India that we look at in Delhi and the northern region, too, is still caused by agriculture burning. 
You, know, you want to head it off at the pass. That's the thing that they're trying to work on right now, but with limited success. Uh, what else did I miss on that one? Personal the second? relationships. Oh, uh, yeah. And it's tough to say. I mean, when we look at foreign investment into India, a lot of it is done by DIPP's own numbers, and they look at the point of last departure. So, you know, they, they, Indian government ministers run around the world and say, well, Mauritius is the number one investor into India, 40% of all FDI. Singapore's number two. The United States is number five. Mauritius is number one, you know? So we don't really have a good handle in terms of incrementally how much more investment has come from the United States. We know that FDI into India is averaging $45, $50 billion a year, significantly higher than its total over the last, than its average over the last 20 years. How much of that is the United States? Tough to say. You can measure U.S.-India trade a little more effectively, and there you see a pretty big bump. I mean, despite all these trade bows, all the trade concerns you got from the United States, India now is our number nine trading partner, and guess what? U.S. exports to India last year, even in light of all these trade problems, grew 28%, almost a third bump on U.S. exports to India, despite rising customs duties and stuff. So it's tough to quantify the foreign investment side because the numbers are shaky. The trade side is pretty clear. Um, you know, there has been a bump, but measuring that, almost impossible. Okay, about the economic woes spilling over into this strategic relationship. Yes, it could happen, but I would expect that the, you know, the national security advisor or the secretary of state would be the bulwark against that. So it, it could be, if it boils down to that. Um, Hopefully, uh, I mean, Trump is so unpredictable, it's very difficult to say what he might tweet one fine morning. I mean, he's so obsessed with Harley Davidson's, you know, 50 motorbikes, but <laughs> it somehow has touched a chord. Uh, even the company doesn't want him to go Talk on about it, about it. Uh, but he does. So, and considering the fact that the US will go into election mode very soon, um, anything could happen. But uh, I'm fairly confident that the State Department and the National Security Council uh, officials will protect the relationship. Um, because, you know, to ruin this relationship and take China on in Asia, that doesn't make sense for the US. Okay, hard to deny Ram Guha a quack, uh, quick last word. Can we just get him quickly a microphone? I mean, the guy's written 2,000 pages on Gandhi, so he gets one question. <laughs> well, before the 2,000 pages on Gandhi, 1,000 pages on Indian democracy. <laughs> so this is, this is a comment on Indian democracy. You know, I think I've been listening to all of this. It's been incredibly illuminating. But I want to link the discussion with what Barkha said. Yeah. And particularly the vulnerability of the Indian Muslim. The, you know, uh, economics is one thing with due respect, but everyday life goes beyond economics. And human safety and morality goes beyond economics. And there is a great danger uh, with the BJP of India becoming a Hindu Pakistan and worse. And from the point of view of the elections, the best result uh, for everything, including economics, and for the survival of the republic would be a weakened Modi with enough, and this is where the states come in, with enough states, uh, regional parties as part of the coalition, particularly regional parties from the south, which will tame the bigotry of the Amit Shahs and the Adityanath. Two names who haven't been mentioned, yeah. who are truly nasty, evil people who will destroy my country. So please, you know, don't, uh, on the grounds of uh, rational economic decision making, don't mock coalitions. Yeah. Because coalitions and a moderating voice may be necessary for the survival of India. I agree so, with that point yeah. entirely. Thank you. I uh, think JDU and others being in the coalition is going to be a very good thing because they rely on Muslim votes. Yeah. More, more than JDU, also TRS, uh, you know, uh, Jack uh, and yeah. others. Yeah. Yeah. Agree with the point. Uh, just a final point here, and it's apt because Irfan is here. Uh, those of you who have not read Irfan's first book, on coalition politics and economic performance shows decisively and conclusively that coalition governments have been better for most things in India, especially the economy, than single party majority governments. Uh, and you can interrogate Irfan during the lunch break as to why that's the case, but a lot of the fear mongering that goes on about coalition governments is actually not particularly well founded. So with that plug, thank you very much, thanks, and thanks all of you.